on World News Tonight. Lethal landslides. Brazil sees deaths rack up following one of the worst climate disasters the country has ever seen as more torrential rain keeps increasing the possibility of even more threats to the vulnerable citizens. Tonight, the details on the disaster. Border build-up. NATO reveals that Russia may be playing a double game as troops at the border of the Ukraine only seem to be increasing in number. Despite this, Putin insists on negotiations rather than firepower. Relaxing restrictions. Mask mandates and other requirements around the world are finally easing back as governments try to return to pre-pandemic life. However, caseloads may still be on the verge of escalation. Amazing air show. Singapore takes to the skies with magnificent maneuvers of massive aircrafts that amaze viewers worldwide. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off tonight's coverage with deadly landslides in Brazil. Severe weather has caused the deaths of almost 60 people in the Petropolis that are told still being expected to rise due to the chaotic conditions of landslides caused by heavy rains and floodings in the area. Local government officials on Wednesday said heavy rain and landslides left at least 58 people dead in Petropolis a city in a mountainous region of Brazil. The downpour flooded city streets after rainfall on Tuesday exceeded expectations for the entire month of February. The floods destroyed homes, left vehicles in ditches, and displaced more than 300 people. Rescue teams are still searching for survivors. Claudio Castro, the governor of Rio de Janeiro State, arrived on the scene Tuesday night. I think that it is not time yet to discuss numbers. Our work now is to try to find survivors in this horror scene, to clean and to rescue any bodies that are here. Up to 80 houses were hit by landslides in an area called Moro da Oficina, according to authorities, who expect the death toll to rise. Locals are working to clear city streets and buildings damaged by rain and mud. Regiane Diaz is a merchant in Petropolis. The water is two meters high. Very, very, very much water. Lots of water. Lots of water. Nobody has ever seen this. We've never seen anything like what happened here yesterday. I don't know what to say. We lost everything. A total loss. President Jair Bolsonaro, who was in Russia to meet with President Vladimir Putin on Wednesday, said he had spoken with officials to secure assistance to the city. Since December, heavy rains have triggered deadly floods and landslides in northeast Brazil and Sao Paulo state. In a tense turn of events, it has been revealed by NATO that despite Russia claiming to pull troops and equipment from the border, it has detected an increase of stationed forces in the area, causing confusion and uncertainty as to move Russia would pull next. With Russia announcing a partial pullback of forces, could the crisis in Ukraine be over? NATO certainly doesn't think so. The alliance has accused Russia of, in fact, sending more troops to the border. This was Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg on Wednesday. They have always moved forces back and forth. Uh, so just that we see movement of forces, so battle tanks doesn't uh, uh, confirm a real withdrawal. Um, uh, it has been a bit up and down, back and forth all the way. But the trend of the last uh, weeks and months has been a steady increase in the Russian uh, capabilities uh, close to Ukraine's uh, borders. Um, so uh, Russia uh, retains uh, the capability of uh, a full-fledged invasion of uh, Ukraine. Moscow announced a partial pullback of forces from near Ukraine on Tuesday. Russia's defense ministry on Wednesday published video of military vehicles leaving the Crimean Peninsula, an area Moscow seized from Ukraine in 2014. In spite of this, a senior Western official speaking on the condition of anonymity said intelligence showed Russian military exercises would be at their most active during the remainder of February. 
He said there were no credible signs at this point that there would be any kind of military de-escalation. NATO is considering new steps to deter Moscow on its eastern flank in response to the Russian threat in Ukraine's north, east and south. Russia says it never planned to attack Ukraine but wants to lay down red lines to prevent its neighbour from joining NATO, which it sees as a threat to its own security. Both sides have said they remain open to diplomacy. Moving on to the diplomatic talks in EU, French President Emmanuel Macron hosted African leaders ahead of an expected announcement that France is withdrawing its troops from Mali after an almost decade-long deployment to battle the jihadist insurgents. On the menu at the Elysee Palace's working dinner, the future of Operation Barkhan. French President Emmanuel Macron is keen to show he's not the only one pulling the strings with other major players in attendance. Among his guests, leaders of the G5 Sahel forces and members from the European Union whose soldiers are stationed in the region as part of Tukuba, a European military task force. Leaders are calling on the junta in Mali to cooperate after they went back on previous commitments to hold elections. In recent days, the French government has taken an increasingly hardline stance. The statu quo was not the status quo is not possible with the deteriorating situation in Mali after the seizure of power by the junta, the refusal to apply a timetable for democratic return, and the use of private Russian militia. After nine years of military intervention, French forces have been unable to defeat jihadists in the Sahel. They've lost 53 soldiers in their own ranks to attacks on the ground. There are currently 4,300 French troops in the Sahel. More than 2,000 of them are stationed in Mali. The region is now holding its breath to find out whether Macron will confirm the withdrawal of troops from the country. Paris is counting on its allies to support states across the Gulf of Guinea. This is the threat of jihadist attacks continues to grow. The departure of Barkhane and Takuba creates a vacuum. We will be forced to increase our defence forces. We will be forced to ramp up the protection of our borders. We will be obliged to buy weapons, to have a greater professionalisation, but this is our duty too. France is looking to transfer some of its troops to Niger. Hundreds of US soldiers are already stationed in the country. Niger is also home to Operation Barkhane's main airbase. Still in the EU, the European Union's top court cleared the way for the bloc to potentially cut billions of euros in handouts to Poland and Hungary, where populist rulers stand accused of violating democratic rights and freedoms. Hefty financial losses racking up for Poland and Hungary. As the EU's top court rejects their legal challenge against a mechanism set up to withhold EU funds to those violating the bloc's laws. The two former communist countries have received substantial financial support to help develop their economies since they joined the EU in 2004. But both Warsaw and Budapest have imposed political control over the judiciary and media and restricted civil rights, going against the bloc's common democratic standards required to receive funding. Polish authorities protested that an individual state's law should supersede EU rules and said the bloc is meddling in legal areas which have never been transferred to the EU. The European Commission can direct blackmail against any member state by taking away the funds. Today, Poland and Hungary are the targets. Why? Because the governments in Warsaw and Budapest are conservative governments. They care about traditional values. They oppose the leftist mainstream that comes from Brussels. Meanwhile, the Hungarian justice minister accused the court of making a political ruling prompted by the country's new legislation limiting teaching about homosexuality and transgender issues. We insist that we must protect our children from any kind of sexual propaganda. It's the child protection law that's the problem, not the rule of law. Billions of euros are at stake, as is the bloc's internal cohesion. EU Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen welcomed the ruling, saying guidelines would be adopted in coming weeks on how to apply the mechanism in practice. 
Over in North Korea now, a joint think tank report suggests only engagement at the highest level can break the current impasse between Pyongyang and Washington. According to South Korea envoy to the United States, the Allies are reviewing measures to restart talks with the regime. A study suggests that the standstill between Pyongyang and Washington can only be solved by the two sides' leaders. A joint simulation report this week by Washington-based think tanks, the Quincy Institute and the United States Institute of Peace, as well as South Korea's Sejong Institute, said negotiating teams are unlikely to actively seek talks by themselves. It added, though achievements were limited, the Kim-Trump summit in 2018 and 2019 showed the potential for what's possible when there's engagement at the very top level. The report also stressed the need for coordination with Congress on North Korea to ease concerns that the U.S. might walk away as it did from the Paris Agreement in 2017 and the Iran nuclear deal in 2018. Other suggestions included starting with smaller, more reversible measures and Washington initiating negotiations, suggesting the idea of Biden sending a private letter to Kim Jong-un. On Tuesday, South Korean ambassador to Washington Lee Soo-hyuk told reporters that Seoul and Washington are reviewing ways to bring Pyongyang back to talks. He added that North Korea remains unresponsive to the Biden administration's calls for dialogue. North Korea test-fired missiles seven times last month and signaled possibly returning to nuclear and ICBM tests. Over the weekend, the top diplomats of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan met and talked about ways to stop the situation from getting worse. There, the South Korean side reportedly suggested additional measures to engage with North Korea, and sources say the U.S. paid attention to those ideas. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. We now move on to the updates on the COVID pandemic. The crackdown on truckers protesting in Canada may have taken another step as police in Ottawa have given the group an ultimatum, leave or face the repercussions. However, their threats may be falling on deaf ears as most of the members in the peaceful protests do not intend to abandon the movement. Leave or face arrest. That's the message on leaflets handed out by police in Ottawa on Wednesday to truckers and protesters blockading the city's downtown. And it looks like the first step in a promised crackdown to end a noisy but largely peaceful protest in the Canadian capital over the government's COVID-19 restrictions, now in its third week. At least one large rig did leave the blockade, but others remained unmoved. One demonstrator simply ripped it up. And a sign posted on a toilet in the protest area read, Attention police, place all tickets here. Police say some 33 people have already been arrested. Ottawa residents who say they've endured some incessant honking, blocked streets, verbal harassment and litter have expressed frustration with police who, until now, have mostly watched the protest rather than intervening. This is not a peaceful protest. As pressure built, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau this week took a rare measure invoking Canada's Emergencies Act, which, pending parliamentary approval, would empower his government to cut off protesters' funding and reinforce provincial and local law enforcement with federal officers. The federal public safety minister on Wednesday blamed extremist groups for helping organize protests in Ottawa and at U.S. border crossings. Police in the province of Alberta this week arrested 13 people linked to a border blockade there and seized guns. Four members of the group have been charged with conspiracy to commit murder. To maintain a valid vaccination pass in France, a booster dose of the COVID-19 vaccine will be, have to be administered no later than four months after the end of the initial vaccination, except for those who have contracted the disease since. We have Abdul Rahman Wernie, special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna, who joins us now from Normandy in France. For more, Chetana. Yes, Shanali. People who received their booster doses at the last minute before vaccine pass validity periods change are being accorded a grace period of one week before their passes are deactivated. The time frame in which people could receive a booster dose before their vaccine pass expired was shortened from seven months after their second to four. Government information pages state the QR code displayed on vaccine certificates becomes valid seven days after injection. 
and so people who had just received their booster in the past week were at risk of losing their pass. Nearly 4 million people were set to see their passes expire yesterday. Some 9 million people have not yet received their booster dose, but at least half of them have been infected with COVID and so will be able to use a certificate of recovery for their vaccine pass. This comes as France is easing rules against the COVID-19 pandemic as confirmed cases decline from record day high in early January, indicating that bars and nightclubs are eligible to restore their businesses. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adderana World News Special Correspondent Chetan Dharman Ratna reporting from Normandy in France. Developing nations receiving the AstraZeneca jab rollout are facing an unforeseen hurdle, which is the short shelf life of the jab. The fast expiration is causing complication in its rollout, leaving nations short of ideal supply amounts. The relatively short shelf life of AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine has complicated the rollout to the world's poorest nations. That's according to officials and internal World Health Organization documents. It is the latest headache to plague the COVAX vaccine sharing project, co-led by the WHO and aimed at getting shots to the world's neediest people. According to COVAX data and officials, the problem with the short shelf life largely concerns AstraZeneca, COVAX's second biggest supplier after Pfizer. Many vaccines are arriving with only a few months, sometimes weeks, before their use by date. Some countries have had to destroy expired doses, including Nigeria, which dumped up to 1 million AstraZeneca vaccines in November. Two and a half months of shelf life is the minimum duration African countries reckon they need to administer the shots. But AstraZeneca said since the start of the global rollout, more than 250 million of its shots left factories with less than two and a half months before expiry. Gavi, the non-profit that co-runs COVAX alongside the WHO, said about 30 million AstraZeneca shots were rejected or deferred last year by poor nations. That amounts to a quarter of AstraZeneca donated shots via COVAX. Many were later reassigned to other countries, Gavi added, noting that more than 95% of them were AstraZeneca. It did not say where to. Other than short shelf life, COFAX's complex system to assign doses to countries, donor requests to deliver them to selected nations and quality checks often eat into the vaccine's short life. Millions of Moderna and Pfizer vaccines could also go wasted, some African countries warned in the WHO document. The problem has been often linked to low vaccine uptake and insufficient cold chain equipment to distribute these shots in remote regions. Gavi said it has encouraged AstraZeneca to apply to the WHO for an extension of the expiration date. But talks have not led yet to a formal application. Over in the United States now, as the government has decided that it's time to take a step back from strict requirements to battle the pandemic by reducing the specificity of the country's various mask mandates, many health experts stating the scientific science of it all confirms that the virus is not something to battle as fiercely as the beginning of the outbreak. Facing pressure over face masks, tonight the CDC is reviewing but not yet ready to shift its guidance, saying Americans nationwide still need to wear them indoors, though change is coming. We're moving toward a time when COVID isn't a crisis, but is something we can protect against and treat. The agency could loosen its stance on masks as early as next week, but today authorities said hospitals remain far too stressed, even as cases, deaths and hospitalizations drop. We want to give people a break from things like mask wearing when these metrics are better. While the CDC insists it's following the science, governors easing mandates amid public pressure say so are they. It's science-based. California, the latest to roll back mandates. Today, no outdoor mask requirement in Los Angeles for mega events like the Rams parade that drew thousands. However, the city still requires them indoors. 
Meantime, organizers at Coachella and Stagecoach won't mandate masks, vaccinations, or negative tests for the tens of thousands expected to flood the concert series. It comes as corporations like Walmart, Amazon, Disney, and Tyson Foods also ease restriction. With the growing push to also end mask mandates in schools... Tonight, the CDC under pressure as the face off over masks remains as heated as ever. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Thousands of Liberians celebrated the 200-year anniversary of the birth of the West African state with a mass rally in the capital, Monrovia. Founded as a colony in 1822 by former U.S. slaves, Liberia became a republic 25 years later, becoming Africa's first. Italy's world-renowned espresso may soon go into heritage books as something more than just a drink as the country's prized social and cultural rituals is considered to be a national heritage worthy of UNESCO status. One of the most iconic landmarks in the United States is the Hollywood sign located in Los Angeles. But the more than 15-meter tall letters were replaced with Rams House to celebrate the LA Rams Super Bowl victory. Weeks after leading a successful coup, Burkina Faso's military leader was sworn in as president with a promise to deal with the mountain insecurity that ousted the predecessor. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with magnificent views of Singapore's airlines taking to the skies to amaze viewers from across the globe. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.